So let's finish up the digestive system. We're going to look at the gallbladder and uh, some other things that are left. All right, so the gallbladder is this pear-shaped organ here. It is on the inferior surface of the liver. It's connected to the cystic duct and joins the hepatic duct, which are both, here's the hepatic hepatic there, cystic there. See, it joins those. The function is to store bile in between meals and then concentrate it by reabsorbing water. Um, it also, uh, you can have issues with it when you get things like gallstones, right? We've heard gallstones, we know they're very painful. Uh, these can form whenever bile salts, pigments, uh, and cholesterol are in a very high concentration uh, so that they actually precipitate out. And this can occur along with gallbladder inflammation, which we call cholecystitis. So what exactly is bile? Bile contains bile salt, uh, pigments, electrolytes, cholesterol. Um, bile salts serve to emulsify fats. They break down fats. They surround them, and we'll look at emulsification here in a moment, uh, and help us so that we can break them down. They also help to absorb fatty acids, fat-soluble vitamins, and cholesterol. Uh, we have bile pigments, and this is bilirubin and bilirubin. We bake, break bilirubin down in order to uh, make it smaller so we can excrete it as biliverdin. When you're not able to do that, it creates problems. And we call that jaundice. Uh, bilirubin is a byproduct of hemoglobin from red blood cells. And so infants having jaundice is uh, something that is a problem just because the infants haven't fully formed uh, some particular mechanisms, but when adults have this, it's a much greater problem. When chyme that is high in fat content enters the duodenum or uh, duodenum, uh, cholecytokinin is going to stimulate the gallbladder to contract and then it's going to release bile. So bile salts help with, they help digestive enzymes and they help the absorption of fatty acids. They do this by forming what we call uh, missiles, not like missiles, but M-I-C-E-L-L-E-S. And this is where water surrounds and makes uh, the fatty acids soluble in chyme and easier for epithelial cells to um, absorb. So basically they're reducing surface tension and they are taking this fat globule here and the bile salt is going to surround it and you can see all the way around that process of emulsification and break them apart into small droplets. And this is basically what happens whenever you put salt up uh, salt. Um, soap in the sink with greasy water. It breaks it all apart, right? That's emulsification, okay? So without the aid of bile, you will very poorly be able to absorb lipids. It just won't work very well. And that will cause vitamin deficiencies because um, lipids help us to absorb fat-soluble vitamins, vitamins like A, D, E, and K. And then we can actually recycle and use those bile salts again and return them to the liver. From the stomach, food is going to pass into the duodenum, then go through the jejunum, and then the ileum. Let's trace this through. What's a good color here? All right, so food's going to come from the stomach on through the duodenum, or duodenum if you would like to call it. It's going to go through here to the jejunum, all right, and then it's going to finally come down here and reach and pass through the ileum. Um, going to receive the secretions from the pancreas and the liver here and that's going to complete the digestion of nutrients so di digestion is completed here all right um, it's going to complete digestion of those nutrients and what remember now once it is liquefied it is called chyme and then transport the rest of those onto the large intestine so we can get rid of the waste products we also here have a good picture of some mesentery all right uh, and the greater omentum here that drapes kind of over the large intestines Here's a really good illustration of the greater omentum here, and the greater omentum has a function. It has a purpose. The purpose of the greater omentum is to prevent parietal and visceral uh, peritoneum in the abdominal cavity from sticking to each other, sticking to the uh, abdominal wall, or to the ileum. 
So let's go ahead and look at the structure of the small intestines. What is the wall of the small intestines like on the inside? It's got tiny projections that we call villi, and these are mucosal. We do have uh, mucus lining them, um, and these serve to increase the surface area. So if we have a surface that is like this, or a surface that is like this, which one will have more surface area? Well, if you picked this one, you're absolutely right. So what does surface area do for us? Well, if we increase surface area, we increase the amount of area that we're able to absorb nutrients, okay? We can absorb nutrients in this surface area with more surface area. Um, and so each little villus, villus is singular, villi is plural. So each individual villus has simple columnar epithelium. You can see here you have some blood vessels. You can see there is a lacteal or a lymph is the green here a lymph capillary uh, we have some nerve fibers that innervate here as well and there are some goblet cells remember what a goblet cells do they uh, secrete mucus right mucus is important because it's protective um, and then these columbar cells uh, the the villi actually have microvilli and we'll see that in the next uh, slide so you don't have to wait for me to try to draw that out for you okay so we'll look at the microvilli um, and these um, we've got the intestinal glands here they're also called crypts of of Libricun, and uh, these are located between the bases of the villi uh, and then we have what we call plique circularis and these are circular folds of mucosa and we're going to look at those on the next slide they're intestinal folds okay uh, villi invite microvilli then there will increase the circular the the surface era area I can't talk today so here you can see the plique circulaires the villi within the and how that forms the micro villi and so each villi also on it has projections micro villi so that really really increases our surface area so what type of secretions does the small intestine have? Well, you probably haven't ever thought about the small intestine actually secreting. Uh, we think about that as just being absorption, which is of course a very important role, but a, a, in order for absorption to occur, we have to have some things like enzymes to help break things down. And we also need that protective mucus, that layer of mucus, all right? And so we have a lot of mucus secreting goblet cells. Then we also have some that are specialized mucus secreting cells. These are glands, we call them Brunner's glands, and they secrete a little bit thicker, more alkaline mu uh, mucus when certain stimuli occur, all right? Uh, we've got digestive enzymes that are embedded right in the membrane, right where we need them, to break food down before absorbing it. So we have things like peptidase, and remember ASE is how we recognize that we have an enzyme. So peptidase, peptid means peptide, so peptidases are enzymes that help to split or break down peptides into amino acids. All right, so remember, proteins have to have several things to break them down because they are so large. We also have sucrase, maltase, lactase. Well, those should sound kind of familiar. ASC means it's an enzyme. Well, what is the, what are those enzymes working on? Well, sucrase helps to split disaccharides like sucrose. Maltase splits a disaccharide into the monosaccharide maltose and lactase breaks it down to, will break down lactose, okay? And so we also have intestinal lipase and that's going to split fatty acids and glycerol okay so it's going to break those down all right so those are the enzymes here those are really important be sure that you know these uh, know these enzymes right here and then here are the hormones that are secreted uh, by the small intestine and we did talk about these in previous slides but they're worth repeating we've got enterokinase and that is going to take the inactive form trypsinogen remember ogen means precursor molecule and convert it to trypsin and then the trypsin will go on and uh, trigger a few other things and then we had somatostatin that's going to inhibit hydrochloric acid secretion by the stomach cholecytokinin remember that is C CCK cholecytokinin and that inhibits gastric glands it will stimulate the pancreas to release some of the pancreatic juice and to stimulate the gallbladder to release that bile which is important
And then lastly here we have secretin, which uh, stimulates the pancreas to uh, secrete those bicarbonate ions. So remember that those are to help act as a buffer. So we have to regulate these secretions, right? Um, mucus acts to protect the intestinal wall. We talked about it a little bit, but I didn't quite point that out. It protects the stomach, we've already said, from um, acids, and it increases the responses to mechanical stimulation uh, when you have an irritant like high gastric juice. Um, and so that is stimulated by the presence of chyme. So when chyme enters the small intestine, we then uh, are stimulated to secrete that mucus. Um, when you have distension in those cells um, of the wall, that will activate the nerve plexus, okay? And so that sends signals to the parasympathetic reflexes that will also help to trigger the release of intestinal enzymes. So actually, as it begins to fill up, all right? So uh, goblet cells secrete when chyme enters, and then as it fills up, distension in the, in the intestinal walls will activate some nerve plexuses, which will send parasympathetic reflexes and will trigger the release of more intestinal enzymes. So we've already said villi increase surface area. That is so important. Villi and microvilli increase surface area. Why is my pen not waking up? Increased surface area, okay? They make the small intestines really the most important absorption organ of the elementary canal. This is where the most absorption occurs. Very, very effective, and there's very, very little material that we don't get absorbed at the end because we have so much surface area that will absorb these things, okay? So, uh, Monosaccharides, monosaccharides, which are simple sugars, and amino acids, how are they uh, absorbed? These guys are absorbed, and you need to know where they're absorbed to. So this part right here, this is important. Simple sugars and amino acids is going to be facilitated diffusion and active transport into the blood, into the blood, all right, directly into the blood, which is a good thing. That's how we get that quick energy, right? Fatty acids and glycerol, remember, need several steps, all right, because they're large. That's going to go into the lymph and the blood, all right. And then electrolytes are going to move uh, in several ways, diffusion, osmosis, and active transport, and those are going to go straight into the blood. This is a really good chart from your textbook. You need to take this and make some um, flashcards of it. All right, and so uh, mostly I just want you to focus on um, how it's absorbed and where, which part of the elementary canal, and then where is it going to, okay? Is it going to the blood or the lymph? All right, so let's look at this picture here in the top. We're looking at digestion breaking down a complex carb. There's a disaccharide there, maltose, so here we have maltose. Uh, it's breaking that complex carb down into simple carbs. So it's splitting it into two glucose molecules so that they're small enough to be absorbed. In the middle here, we're looking at protein digestion. That begins in the stomach via pepsin, okay? Peptide is, is triggered by pepsin, and it is completed in the small intestines. So remember, peptides take multiple steps. Start in the stomach, end in the small intestines. Larger molecules are broken down into amino acids, all right? And then here at the bottom, we're looking at fat digestion, okay? Fat digestion is done almost completely in the intestines, in the intestines. Here we're looking at how fatty acid molecules are broken down. So we're going to start over here in step one. All right. So fatty acid molecules. This, these are skin cells here. All right. So these are epithelial cells, I should say, not skin cells, but epithelial cells. So each little block there is an epithelial cell. You can see on this side we have some villi here. All right. Um, so the fatty acid molecules are going to dissolve in the epithelial cell membranes of the villi. So they're going to go through the villi. You can see that in this gray picture here, through the villi and will diffuse through them. Okay, you see how they're diffusing through here, all right? The endoplasmic reticulum of these cells, of the epithelial cells, use the fatty acids to resynthesize fat molecules similar to the ones that were digested. 
okay? So they kind of mix them up, put them back together. So the fat then collects in clusters, and that becomes uh, surrounded by protein. The larger molecule now is a lipoprotein, uh, so lipid and protein, fat and protein, and we call that a chylomicron, okay? That is here. chylomicron, and this is important, this, should, this will be on your test, all right? And the chylomicron then will make their way to the lacteal, which remember is part of the lymphatic system of the villi, and then we'll have contractions of smooth muscles in the villi that's going to help empty the lacteals into cisterna, and that is an expansion basically of the thoracic duct. So it's going to the thoracic duct duct, not duct. The lymph carries the chylomicrons into the bloodstream, basically. So we talked a little bit about movements of the small intestine. We, looked, we talked about the peristalsis, which is the wave-like movement going down, and then we talked about the mixing and turning, which is kind of more uh, mixing everything up, right? So that's segmentation. That's the ring-like contractions, moving the chyme back and forth and back and forth. Uh, so if the small intestine gets really, really distended or really, really irritated, you can have, and you have probably experienced this in your life, what's called a peristaltic rush. And that's when you have to run to the bathroom urgently because you have diarrhea. So if it becomes too full or irritated, it's going to flush everything out really quickly. Um, we also have the ileocecal sphincter, which joins the small intestine to the large intestine. Um, and another uh, moat point about the large intestine is it's it's named large intestine because it's much larger than the small intestine, but important to point out, I guess. So moving from the small intestine to the large intestine, we already said it's named large intestine because it's duh, larger, right? We have five parts here, and it's important that you know these five parts, okay? And so the first one is going to be the cecum, okay? So the cecum. We also then have the colon, and we have ascending colon, transverse colon here, so ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, uh, and then we also have the S-shaped, kind of S-shaped, sigmoid colon, that's where the S comes from, uh, and then next we have the rectum and the anal canal, all right, and then at the anus, that is the opening, and that is surrounded, of course, by sphincters. We have an internal and an external sphincter there, and then we have the veriform appendix that is attached to the cecum, and that contains some lymphatic tissue, so it does have a uh, immune system function. So the large intestine does not really have any digestive function. It does absorb some water and some uh, electrolytes. We do have goblet cells over here, so we have some mucus secretion there, and that's protective as well. Uh, this is where we have our intestinal flora flora are our good bacteria. Um, this helps to maintain a balance in our system. Uh, it also, of course, forms feces, which is our waste products, and carries out defecation, which is basically just when you poop. Movements of the large intestine are very, very similar to those in the small intestine. Uh, it's a little bit slower and a little bit less frequent than the small intestine, but we still have peristalsis and we still have some mixing movements. Uh, you will usually have a large mass movement after eating. Um, this is, of course, when you feel the urge to go to the restroom. We have what we call the defecation reflex, and that is going to relax the internal uh, sphincter first and then the external sphincter. All right, so all you wanted to know about poop and more. <laughs> what are feces made of? Well, they're made of everything that's not digested or absorbed, which is going to be some water, some electrolytes, mucus, uh, bacteria, uh, bile pigments that are uh, altered by bacteria, uh, actually give the color to poop. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, undigested material like cellulose that we're not able to digest. Uh, it's going to have a pungent odor, of course, you know, sometimes it does, and that's often a side effect uh, or a byproduct, I should say, of bacteria. Some of those uh, products are uh, hydrogen sulfide, which is a, uh, that yellow, gassy, stinky, gassy. Uh, I say yellow, I was thinking of sulfur, um, indole, uh, ammonia, and those are some smells that you are kind of familiar with. 
So what happens to the uh, digestive system as we get older? Uh, your teeth can become sensitive, guns may recede, and of course we often lose teeth. You can have uh, more heartburn, more constipation, nu nutrient absorption decreases. We've talked about not being able to absorb your B12 uh, as you get older. So, you know, your accessory organs age, uh, but in general, our whole system slows down and just doesn't work quite as well as it used to. 